name is Evan Zenobia. I work as the youth editor for UPCI. I also have had the privilege of working as the hyphen resource director for youth ministries. Um, spent a little bit of time in youth ministry myself, a couple years in Washington, D.C., uh, working with inner city students, um, as well as having an opportunity here in St. Louis to uh, work with the hyphen ministry locally. It's really been an incredible experience, and I'm hoping that today I can share with you just some information uh, about curriculum mapping, about scope and sequence, and really about teaching strategies that I think are going to help us to take your youth ministry to the next level, or even help to point out some teaching strategies that I think can apply regardless of where you're situated, what uh, generation you're teaching, or even how you're, you're dealing with students on a week-to-week -week basis. We want to hit on three points today that I have found to be incredibly effective in my own uh, youth ministry, in my own teaching methods. Um, first and foremost, creating a comprehensive teaching strategy through the use of curriculum maps and scope and sequences. Uh, secondly, I would say that we're moving uh, discipleship from Sunday to every day. We want to make sure that we're hitting discipleship and making it an a integral part of a student's life. And finally, I want to talk about intentionally transitioning students from a fringe position to the core position of your youth group or student class. So what does that mean? How does this work? If there's three main points, I want to emphasize the fact that this, the nature of these teaching strategies really is cyclical. They happen uh, not necessarily in any specific order, but it's going to depend on what kind of group you're working with, what kind of students you're working with, uh, how many years you've been in youth ministry. But I promise you, at some point, you're going to find yourself at one of these different stages where we need to address and say, okay, I need to change the way I'm doing this to make an impact, a lasting impact on the students that I'm working with. So let's start with creating a comprehensive teaching strategy first and foremost. We talk about scope and sequence and curriculum maps. You may have uh, heard others use these terms before, but what does that really mean? What is a scope and sequence? I would tell you that first and foremost, consistency in teaching using a curriculum map is necessary to create a culture of learning and personal discipleship within the classroom. The reason being, the reason we push these types of teaching strategies because we want to teach and instruct and, and allow our students to grow in a way that we, we want to determine an end goal. We want to know where they're going at the end of a two or three year stint of this teaching. They may not be consistent students, they may not uh, be very involved students, but if we can assess where our students are at and what they need to learn in order to grow, we can plan out a week-by-week -week goal on how we want to teach and where we want to take them in their spiritual journey. Now this may seem like a daunting task. I understand that we have various age groups. I understand that there are students from a variety of backgrounds and we may not know where each of them is at when they walk into that classroom. But I can promise you that by starting with a bigger picture and understand that we need to teach them key foundational scriptures and stories to lay a foundation for their growth, for their spiritual understanding, for their development as a Christian, we can begin to see a plan take shape. If we begin by starting and looking at various uh, resources offered by Youth Ministries, by Pentecostal Publishing House, by the UPCI as a whole, I know specifically Link 247 curriculum offers a two and three year curriculum map to show you how you can teach through the Bible and show them how creation relates to Jesus' death and resurrection. We can show them how different scripture verses point to Jesus in the New Testament, point to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, point to baptism in the New Testament and in the modern church. We can find these pathways with very little effort through these resources that are offered by our organization to really speak to these students and lay this groundwork for what they're going to become, for how they can learn, for how they can grow in their own understanding of what scripture is, because they're not going to understand certain themes later in the Bible if we don't tell them how sin came into the world, how man fell. We need to start at a good spot to lay these foundations for our students. It's important for us to understand the durations of these 
content maps. It's, it's important for us to understand how long we have to teach our students. If, if they're going to be aging out of this group in a year, maybe there are some steps we can take to uh, maybe outside the classroom push their understanding along to, to show them the important things that they need before they are thrust into a hyphen ministry or a young adult ministry. It's important we leave room for the unexpected within these classrooms. It is very important to be structured. We can lay out everything that we need to on a week-to-week -week basis. We can say, I'm going to teach four weeks on gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to teach four weeks on, on, on tongues, on, on fruit, on receiving the Holy Ghost, on baptism. But if we're not able to take a step back and see that we're having an impact on these students, that maybe one or two weeks we need to take a step back and say they need to experience this firsthand. We're missing some key opportunities. So while it is important to lay out this curriculum, while it is important to lay out a scope and sequence for the next year or two years, it's also important to look at their personal growth and assess that on a week-to-week -week basis. I understand that this seems like maybe I'm throwing a lot at you. I understand that maybe this looks like we're, we're, we're taking a lot of time to, to lay out the way that their life is going to be for the next year or two while you're teaching them in this classroom. But it's important to understand that if we can dedicate and sacrifice a little of our own time, we can make this teaching and growing process much more enjoyable, much more fulfilling for the students that are involved on a week-to-week -week basis. So in creating a comprehensive teaching strategy that informs our next point, and that is moving discipleship from Sunday to every day. When we are creating a culture of education, a culture of growth within our classroom through our teaching strategies, through our scope and sequence, through our intentional teaching plan, our next step is to take the students that are growing and to show them the importance of growth outside of the classroom that we have on a Sunday, the, the service that we have on a Friday or a Wednesday night. Wherever your service or your teaching is, is positioned within the week, what's important is that we show students that growth and our lifestyle as a Christian goes far beyond what we're doing in those services, but it needs to be a part of their everyday experience with Jesus Christ. The importance of culture, of personal discipleship, starts in the classroom and manifests itself through students want to participate in personal study and devotion at home and during the week. I would tell you that your consistency encourages culture. Culture is a buzzword in our movement. It's a buzzword in youth ministry and hyphen ministry. It's something that we all strive for, but I think at times we don't necessarily know what it looks like when it is taking shape. I would tell you that regardless of where you're at in your youth ministry, even if you have a thriving culture, you probably understand that it is your consistency in relationships, it's your consistency in teaching, it's your consistency in the way that you operate within the local church that encourages these students to embrace the culture that you are creating. It starts with you. Certainly, there are close students of yours, people that you have taught, people that you work with that help to encourage that culture, but it starts with you. Secondly, I would tell you that the culture will encourage a student's consistency. When a student on your fringes sees the involvement and the engagement of a core student and the way that they're engaging in personal discipleship and growing and just their involvement on a weekly basis, it helps to show a, like a positive peer in integration. It shows the way that peers can interact and push each other to be better. That is what defines a culture within a youth group. Students that may not hang out outside of a classroom, students that may not interact even that much within your youth group, still having an impact on one another and showing that the fruit of the Spirit is a very real thing that can encourage students to be better at who they are. So, we look at some statistics that Barna, in one of their most recent studies, has, has given us um, regarding evangelical Christians. Now, I understand that this isn't a perfect one-to-one -one ratio or representation of uh, United Pentecostal Church, um, but I think it gives us some insight into generation, generation Z and Millennials within our organization. I would say, first and foremost, they found that 13% of Generation Z, evangelical Generation Z, 
admits that they are atheist. Secondly, I would point that 32% of Gen Z has confessed that they view pornographic materials regularly. So it's a very troubling statistic. Uh, the same study shows us that 68% of parents ignore a child's spiritual growth. That means parents are not so much involved at home, and even if they are, they're not pushing their students with devotionals, they're not pushing their students to be more engaged and involved on a spiritual level. And so, unfortunately, while we do know that it should begin and end with the work that parents are doing within a home, 68% that do not push their, their children to do better, it falls on us for that 68%. It falls on us as teachers, as youth leaders, as hyphen leaders, to really make a difference, to make an impact in these students' lives and to show them the necessity of discipleship and spiritual growth on their own time. The final statistic that I wanna share with you today is that 62% of millennials say that they left the church before the age of 18. What this shows us is an incredible breakdown of uh, personal discipleship and a foundational education, I think, of these students where they maybe didn't understand what they believed or why they believed what they believed. Um, obviously, that number is informed by a number of factors that we can't hope to, to capture within these statistics. But again, I think it informs us uh, on the bigger issue in that if we can make personal discipleship something that happens every day throughout the week for a young man or a young woman, it's going to make a lasting impact that maybe they won't leave the church before 18. Maybe they will have an experience like never before that will propel them into their adult years and really cement them as a believer, as a Christian. It's going to be integral and it's going to fall upon us somewhat and how we teach and what we teach. And again, even though I know it, it, it can be difficult for us to lay out such a plan or create such a culture, it shows us that we can, if we take the time to invest, if we take the time to be intentional about our relationships and encouraging our students to be involved in Christ-like activity and, and, and reading and, and fasting and prayer more often than they currently are, it's gonna change the way that they experience Christ. It's going to change the way that they experience even more teaching, even, even the, the sermon that's presented on Sunday, even the, the teaching that's presented on Wednesday night. It's going to change their outlook of who Christ is and what their place is within the kingdom of God. Personal discipleship and devotion needs to be emphasized and exercised during these formative years or we risk losing our students forever. Devote 365, 1.0, 2.0, are, are just a couple of examples of, of devotionals that our organization provides. There are a number of other uh, Bible studies or a number of other um, devotionals that we offer. What's important is that we get our students involved in reading, that we get our students involved in fasting, that we get our students involved in just partaking in, in who Jesus is and what he wants them to be each and every day. And if we can even encourage them to take five minutes, that's all it takes to make a lasting impact. I know for me, when I was younger, it took just a youth pastor encouraging me to take just a couple minutes to pray, to fast, to just push me on a daily basis, to, to find the time to text me and remind me and say, hey, just wanted to see if you're doing this. Those kinds of encouragements are the difference between a lost student and a student that goes on to do such great things for God within the church. Finally, I would point to intentionally transitioning students from the fringe to the core. Now, what do I mean by this? There will always be students that need to be ushered from the outer edges of your youth group to the core of your youth group. I have no doubt that there are students that you currently teach that are everyday prayers, everyday devotionals, uh, they take part in who Jesus is and what it means to be a Christian without being prompted, without being asked. These are people that are the core of your youth group and they inform what is happening. They inform the culture. And when we have a healthy core, the rest of that group will flourish. But with youth ministry, there's always young people coming in. There's always 
young men and young women that are, are experiencing Jesus or the love of Jesus through a core student for the first time. And so they're brought into the fringes. They don't necessarily know anybody else within that group. They don't know what it's like to even be in a service most of the time. And yet they sit on the fringes and they, they attend from week to week. They, they're involved in, in certain youth retreats or youth outings. They're there. They're on the fringes. And they're waiting for the opportunity to be, to be brought into that core of understanding, that core of foundation, and that core of culture. Fringe students may represent a small sample size of your overall group, sure. But they're also the most volatile. What do I mean by this? Fringe students are the keys to revival and untapped social groups. Yes, it's possible that this student could show up one week and be gone the next and you never see them. They're very unstable in their beliefs, but they also represent an untapped culture, an untapped group of students that you may not have even interacted with, that, that the student that brought them may not have even interacted with. We have to be quick when we deal with volatile students, we deal with fringe students because we want to anchor them in certain ways. Teaching them will require more time. It will require more planning. It will require more structure like we talked about in our comprehensive teaching strategies. It's going to use professional resources. It's going to require us to go hunting for what our organization offers, for what youth ministries offers, for what Pentecostal Publishing House offers. It's going to require us to look outside and say, oh, elements for youth, elements for children, elements for adult. These are all new convert resources that I can use to, to lay a foundation, to anchor this fringe student and show them that they can be a part of this core, a part of this Christian experience, like something they've never experienced before. Reaching unchurched students should be our number two behind helping our church students. Reaching those unchurched and, and providing them with the understanding of who they can be in Christ, what their life can be like if they just embrace the love of Jesus and embrace the Bible and understanding of who he is and who they, they can be in Jesus Christ is going to be integral with changing the way that your group operates on a week-to-week -week basis. Your youth group, if you can utilize and, and impact your fringe students, your youth group will never be the same. Your core will change and it will grow and it will begin to envelop that group more completely than I think you can ever imagine. And when that happens, that culture that we talked about is going to change the course of not just your youth group, but I promise that it's going to change the direction of your church as a whole. It's going to change the way that you evangelize. It's going to change the groups that you reach on a weekly basis because you are focusing on the ones that are most volatile, the ones that can be most on fire for the change in their life that Jesus is making happen. These students, these untapped fringe students represent so much more than just the occasional visitor. They represent so much more in the means of revival within your church. I promise you that reaching unchurched students will fuel your group and create a lasting culture of education and evangelism that will outlive your ministry many, many years. What's important to realize again is that this is a cyclical grouping. This is not something that you jump in and say, well, I have to start with a comprehensive teaching strategy. You may be in a time where you have a number of fringe students, a number of students that are fresh and don't understand who they are in Christ yet. And so you may start at point three and work your way back by creating that culture through teaching, through understanding. But the beauty of it is that if we can just find the place where we need to start. I know personally, when I worked with youth, when I uh, worked as a youth pastor for the last couple of years, I have worked predominantly with um, fringe students with inner city students that did not have a foundation of understanding. They didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know who Noah was. They didn't know what the flood was, what, what sin and iniquity was. They didn't understand these terms. And so we had to begin at a very basic level to provide a foundation for these students, to, to show them that what is important is just understanding who Jesus is, what his love represents, and why we need to fight against sin through repentance, through baptism, through the Holy Ghost. Some of these things, some of these stories 
They are very, very important to a churched individual, but we really need to tap into the love of Christ and what it means for these unchurched students to even find a place to begin, to change the culture, to create a culture. It's a beautiful thing when you realize that you are on the cusp of creating culture, when you can feel and see that your students are beginning to operate and act on their own in a way that is going to inform how the rest of that group, how the rest of that uh, core group of students interacts with each other. It's a beautiful thing when you can see just that students develop. It's a beautiful thing when you see your first student baptism, when you see your first visitor receive the Holy Ghost, when you see the light turn on when you're teaching a Bible study to a group of students that may have only been coming for a couple of weeks. These are the things that fuel us as youth and hyphen ministers, as youth and hyphen leaders, to see that light go on, to see a, 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 a lighting up, a change within somebody because of the work that we're putting in. It may require sacrifice. It may require our time. It may require our money. I realize that is one of the most difficult things at times is to give up some money or to find money within the church budget to say, I need this to train our young people, to disciple our young people, to put something within them, to push them to be better Christians. But the resources are there. We're working constantly at United Pentecostal Church, at Youth Ministries, at the Pentecostal Publishing House, tirelessly to put together teaching plans uh, training materials, resources to reach the unchurched. This is our passion. This is what we are focused on doing, and we want to share these resources with you. We want you to have that experience when a young person receives the Holy Ghost for the first time. We want to usher that into your classroom and show you that culture can change the way that your church operates from the top down. These students are your lifeline. They are your heartbeat. I know that you care so much for who they are and what they represent. And if we can tap into these students and show them what it means to be a true Christian, I promise that your life, your Christian walk, your ministry, and your culture will begin to expand like you've never seen before. I pray that I can help in any sort of way that Pentecostal Publishing House, Youth Ministries, that we can offer you the resources that you need to be effective in everything that you do. And I hope that you take this to heart today and begin to tap into the resources and tap into your core students and show them how important it is to make Jesus an everyday part of their life. It falls on you. And I wish it didn't fall so heavily upon our youth and hyphen leaders, but it falls on you to make the first step, to take the first action to create this culture of education and evangelism and change. But we're with you today. And I hope that some of these strategies that I've provided today, some of these things that I've given you to help think critically about how you're teaching can help to take your youth ministry to the next level. Thank you so much for your time.